Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, we're going to take a quick tour of many of the HTML elements that are associated with defining paragraphs and giving semantic meaning to runs of text. So as we're getting started, it's important to remember what I said earlier. Even though your tendency might be to think about the presentation, or in other words, the aesthetics of the web page, you need to think about HTML in terms of semantics. In the case of paragraphs and text, it's the difference of thinking about a particular run of text in a paragraph as being important rather than merely bold or underlined. Do you see the difference there? In one case, I'm thinking about the intent of the run of text. Uh, it's important. Uh, in the other, I'm thinking about its formatting, its presentation. So therein lies the key difference. The same would be true when we use paragraphs in lesson number two. You might recall that I had this running dialogue with myself. Uh, in fact, let's go ahead and take a look. I have it right here. Let's look at the after folder. And I was specifically talking to myself about this section here. We have a paragraph defined here and then another paragraph defined right here where we're including uh, some URLs or IP addresses. And the internal dialogue I had as I was vocalizing it was that I really wanted to put a paragraph kind of to surround all of these things, but yet I needed this vertical spacing so that conventionally it would look correct on a web page. Uh, so the way I solved it was to use a paragraph around all the highlighted text you see there, but then to use line breaks because that's the semantic purpose of the line break. Um, you know, so I hope you see the difference there in my way of thinking. I'm looking at the structure of the content merely in terms of vertical spacing versus about thinking about things as complete thoughts. And the complete thought argument won out. And that's why I wrapped the paragraph around the entire complete thought and then used the line breaks uh, conventionally to add some spacing in between, you see? So I'm keeping thematically complete ideas together as one unit. All right, so once you get that distinction down, uh, moving from present, merely presentation onto semantics, it'll become easier and easier to understand the purpose of each of the elements that we look at in the specification. So I want you to recall from the previous videos, uh, the last video, that we were looking at the specification here. We we're looking at the version of the specification called HTML5 edition for web authors. It's draft 29 created in March 2012. You might have access to a new, newer version of it. That's great. The changes will probably be nominal. You can still follow along with what I'm doing. All right. And I encourage you to do that. But if you scroll down uh, on this document, there will be a table of contents and it's a pretty intense uh, a table of contents with a lot of level of indentation, which is awesome. So the way that I, I choose to use this is to, in Internet Explorer, hit Control F on my keyboard to open up the Find toolbar. And then I can search, for example, the Strong element, and that'll lead to the link that I can right click and select open a new tag, specifically talking about the strong element as we address that in that section of the video. So now I can learn about its definition and see some examples of strong in use. And we'll come back to strong in just a little bit. This was just a quick example. That's how I'm going to use it. I'm going to right click on each of these individual items in order to learn more about them. And we'll use that as a style of walking through each of the tags that we're going to cover in the, uh, the next four, five, six lessons, okay? So as we get started, uh, please note that I'm merely gonna show you what I consider to be the most important elements uh, with respect to paragraphs and uh, giving semantic meaning to runs of text. We've already seen some of these in action from lesson number two. Some of them are gonna be completely new, but in all cases, I'm gonna show you basically just a subset of all the possible elements that you could add when uh, defining paragraphs and text within your HTML5 documents. The key takeaway here is that I'm constantly pointing you towards the specification so that we can use the correct element given its intended semantic purpose inside of our document. All right, that's always the key for us. Okay, so let's start with the basics. Remember, you wanna use Control F to, in the find bar, and what we're gonna do is look for the word paragraphs. That should lead you to 3.2.5.3 entitled paragraphs. We're gonna open that in a new tab, and we just wanna understand what is meant when we use the term paragraph. 
And the definition here is great. That's why I wanted to start here. A paragraph is typically a run of phrasing content that forms a block of text with one or more sentences that discuss a particular topic as in typography, but can also be used for more general thematic grouping. For instance, an address is also a paragraph, as is a part of a form, a byline, or a stanza in a poem. And we'll see good examples of each of these in just a moment. Uh, in fact, let's do this. Let, let's go, let's get rid of that and go back to our table of contents, control F, the P element, where we'll see some good examples of the paragraph tag in use. All right, so here are some good examples. We can see a traditional paragraph, a couple of sentences kept together like we would read in a book or a magazine article, all right? But then we can also see the use of a paragraph in a uh, the creation of a form which we would use to collect information from a user. One paragraph for the name, one paragraph for the address, all right? Uh, so we're keeping these collected but thematically separate from each other. Even though they're, they're two fields in the same form, they're still separate fields. All right, the same is true of a, uh, of a poem. Here we have a stanza of a given poem defined by an opening and closing P paragraph tag. And then for each of the individual lines of the poem, we're merely using the line break tag, which we'll get to in just a little bit. So let's hold on to that thought. Um, and then we have some uses and abuses, some examples, and that's uh, very helpful. But uh, structurally, the paragraph tag represents a complete thought, a grouping of sentences or ideas together, but the specification also uses a typography term, a run of phrasing content. Uh, it also uses the word thematic, indicating that it can be used beyond a simple textual paragraph, as we saw some examples of just a moment. And we'll see another one of an address here in a little bit. Um, so that brings us to the next idea, which is the line break tag or the BR element. All right. And I'm going to right click and select open a new tab. And you can see the BR element represents a line break. And uh, let's see if we need a break in the thought of a given paragraph and yet the break is merely conventional in nature, then we can use the line break. And a great example of this is, is a address. We already saw that a paragraph can be used to define an address, but here we see an address created. And by convention, we use these BR elements, the line breaks, because that's how we normally visually see an address. Even though it's still one complete thematic thought, we still use these tags to split it up into their own vertical lines because conventionally, that's how we use it. And then below that, uh, it gives us some correct uses and abuses of the BR element. Uh, so just to recap, addresses in poetry represent good uses, while using it to uh, separate thematically new thoughts is wrong because this is the domain of the paragraph element. Uh, now, I just finished saying, don't worry about presentation. However, it's hard to ignore the default formatting of the paragraph tag. We saw it just a moment ago when we were looking at the work that we did in lesson number two. The default style sheet uh, will, uh, will separate, will give essentially one uh, return, carriage return uh, for a line break item and two carriage returns for a paragraph tag. Uh, but that's the, in this particular odd instance, that's what the BR is used for. It's used to create a single carriage return, essentially, uh, to, give, uh, to give some visual separation. So some of these tags kind of cross, cross between visual and semantic, but that's still the, the semantic value of it, the purpose of it, okay? Let's move on. Talk about uh, formatting the text itself, giving semantic meaning to the text. Uh, and so to do that, let's start with the strong element. And I see it right here, so I'm just gonna right click it, but you could type in the strong element to the find and then open it in a new tab. And you can see the strong element represents strong importance for its content, uh, like a warning message, for example. Now that's in contrast to, if we take a look, let's see look at the B element and open that up in its own tab. And the B element represents a span of text 
text to which attention is being drawn for utilitarian purposes without conveying any extra importance and with no implication of alternate voice or mood such as keywords in a document abstract, product names in a review, actionable words in an interactive text-driven software or an article lead. Now the only reason why I bring this up is because there's some confusion between strong and, and the B element uh, with previous versions of HTML. Um, I think there is now a clear semantic difference between the two. With strong, you are indicating that this text has strong importance. With the B element, it's text that you want to draw attention to. Uh, again, in previous versions, it indicated that you wanted the text to be bold, the B tag. However, uh, for that, you should be using strong for that purpose, uh, semantically. Now, the B element merely means that you're pointing out or highlighting those words, but not saying they're important necessarily. And honestly, that's a difficult distinction to make in my opinion, so I would probably not use the B element as often, preferring other tags that are more suitable for this purpose. But uh, I think the good example of this is where they're using a first paragraph or the first part of a paragraph uh, and indicating this as the lead uh, using a class which we'll talk about a little bit later uh, to say that while this text doesn't have importance like a warning message it does serve a purpose within this paragraph in this article it might be you know the byline for the headline okay so let's go ahead and move on and talk about some other markup elements we're going to look at the mark element and right click and open that in a new tab. And so the mark element, it indicates a run of text highlighted or marked for reference purposes. So a good example is whenever you're presenting search results uh, on a uh, search results page, you can show the occurrences of the word that was being searched for in line. Uh, and then using uh, cascading style sheets, you can highlight that using a background color of yellow or something to call that out. Or you can mark a run of text that you want to call attention to uh, and will explain or describe later in the section. All right, so that's the purpose of mark. Then there's the M, E, M element. And this indicates a word or a phrase of emphasis when you read it where changing the emphasis changes the meaning of the sentence. This doesn't necessarily indicate the importance of that phrase or that word, just the way that you say it. You might be thinking this is similar to italicizing, however there's a slight semantic difference between the M and the I element. So let's open up uh, the I element, which traditionally in the past and previous versions of HTML indicated italicizing. In HTML5, however, the I element represents uh, a term that has a special voice or mood or in some way is offset from the rest of the text. The specification here gives the example of using the I element around uh, a run of text indicating a technical term and it gives another example. Uh, so in this case, look here, here's the technical term. In this other, it gives uh, an example of wrapping it around a dream sequence inside of a short story, okay? And I bring these up, the EM and the I, because the I element was used in previous versions of HTML for presentational purposes to represent italicized text. But in HTML5, using the I element merely for italicizing some text is a semantic no-no. Uh, if you want that uh, to be italicized uh, in the sense that you want it to be read in a different voice or it has some ironic meaning, you would probably choose the EM element instead. All right, so let's go ahead and get rid of these two and move on to the U element. And the U element is used for unarticulated 
uh, text. It indicates a run of text that you want to call attention to because it's misspelled or it has some strange characters due to its rendering from another language. Uh, this is kind of a tough one to describe. I'm only going to call attention to it because its meaning has changed from previous versions of HTML where it was used for presentational purposes. You used to use the U element if you wanted something underlined. In HTML5, again, that is a semantic no-no. Uh, you would use uh, pure, purely cascading style sheets for that purpose. Now you use the U element for unarticulated text. Text uh, that um, you can see for marking stress emphasis. The EM element should be used for marking keywords. The B element or the mark element should be used depending on the context. Uh, you can use the cite element, but don't use the U element for any of those. Instead. Uh, you can use it for uh, uh, text being a proper name in Chinese text, so a Chinese proper name mark, or labeling the text as being misspelled. All right, so that's its true purpose. All right, let's move on from there and talk about the small element. And a lot of what I'm doing, you'll notice here, is I'm trying to correct uh, maybe changes in previous versions of HTML and what that given element means today in HTML5. So if you haven't ever used HTML in the past, maybe this isn't so important to you, but it would definitely uh, be uh, an eye opener if you're hearing this for the first time coming from uh, previous versions of HTML. All right, let's talk about the small element. Think small print, like in those car ad commercials or some text run that's a disclaimer or a caveat or a legal restriction or even a copyright. Uh, just to be clear, just because it uses the the word small doesn't mean that it has to be presented using a small font. Again, think of the meaning of the term, not the presentation. That presentation is the job of cascading style sheets. All right. So we're going to compare that to, or I'm sorry, just let's move on to the S element, which used to mean strike through, but it has a new uh, representation today. It's a run of text that's no longer accurate, but it's left in the document for reference purposes. Now, let me see. Yeah, here's a good example at the bottom of this page. Uh, you'll see that uh, here's an ad, buy our iced tea and lemonade. And then we have an S tag that wraps around this text. Recommended retail price is $3.99 per bottle. That is no longer valid, but it's left in uh, for reference purposes. Now we're selling it for just $2.99 a bottle. All right. And in the past, you would use this to put a line, horizontal line through the text, but that's not necessarily what it's used for. Again, that's thinking presentationally. We want to think semantically that this is information that's no longer valid, but we're leaving in for reference purposes. Okay. Um, so let's contrast this, that, the S element, to the DEL element. And you can see that moves way deeper in our, doc, our outline, our table of contents, to something called edits. And that is the fundamental difference between using S for strike through and DEL for strike through. DEL indicates that the content is marked for remo removal. So the example they provide is to mark a run of text in a to-do list as complete. So you might mark that with DEL, um, uh, the DEL element, and then later on style that text with a strike through. So if you've ever used like an online to-do list, uh, like um, uh, 37 signals applications, typically uh, like Backpack or Basecamp, they have to-do lists and when you you put a, a check mark in one of the, the check boxes, it'll put a line through. That would be a good example of the use of the Dell keyword uh, that could then, uh, that presentationally means like you finish that item and then you could use CSS to add a strike through or a, a horizontal line through that entire line that you've completed. All right. So that's the difference between the S and the Dell elements. Um, and like I said a moment ago, the Dell element really belongs in a separate section of the specification called editing, like we saw back here. Uh, it's used for web applications and content management systems. However, I added here because of its similarity to the S element, like I said a moment ago. All right, moving on, let's talk about the site element, C-I-T-E. And so if you're uh, working on technical papers or a research paper, you might want to use the site element. Uh, let's open that up in a new tab. And so the cite element represents the title of a work, uh, a book, a paper, an essay, a poem, a score, and so on. Uh, 
this can be a work that's being quoted or referenced in detail. Uh, so you use this to identify the title of a work that's being quoted, uh, perhaps in a nearby block quote section. And you can see some examples of this, I believe, here. Well, they don't have a block quote here. But you can see how we're citing uh, specific uh, books, um, comics, tracks from albums, and so on. Here we are citing a Wikipedia article, all right? So it needs to be used in conjunction with uh, perhaps a block quote. So let's look at that. Uh, let's close that up. And we're gonna see a more complete example here. And so the block quote is a grouping element used for quotations from another source. Uh, let's scroll down to find the one that has a good site in it. There we go. Um, so you would then often cite the source inside of the block quote using the cite element that we just looked at a moment ago. The cite can also be used outside of the block quote to call the user's attention to the block quote from, say, a paragraph. Uh, let's see. Yeah, here we go. Take a look at this example. Here we're citing Sonnet 130 and then using the block quote element with a cite property or attribute set to where we pulled this from originally, uh, a web page on some fictitious example, all right, where we have then the actual sonnet being quoted in the block quote, all right? And so again, uh, here's another example of a block quote then in the caption of that block quote, we're citing the specific articles uh, and uh, citing the, uh, the magazine or the, the professional publication where it was originally published. All right, so just keep in mind that block quote and cite sometimes work together and are used whenever you need to reference uh, in a more professional context other uh, websites, documents, books, music, whatever the case might be from around the world, okay? All right, and then let's move on to the code element, and that kind of takes us in a whole other direction. And you can see the code element represents a fragment of computer code. Uh, and so a good example of this as we scroll down is this section here where we are defining a run of text as code specifically code, uh, and we're gonna use the class element to say that this is Pascal programming language. Now this is optional and there is nothing uh, here that would prevent us from putting any language, even something that's not really a programming language. This is probably more for presentational purposes uh, to format this different than say uh, C Sharp or C++ or Visual Basic code, okay? Uh, but at any rate, we're using this uh, this element, code element, again, around a run of text to indicate its semantic meaning, that this is code and it should be interpreted as such for presentation purposes. Uh, there's also this pre-tag, which we're gonna ignore mostly for now. Um, it's used to essentially maintain the indentation levels, for example, the amount of individual spaces, the s fact that this is returned, because otherwise HTML would, would uh, not pay any attention to white space, uh, carriage returns, and things of that nature. Uh, but we're not going to look into that any further in this lesson, at least. Okay? Okay, so let's now take a break and move on from there. And I want to talk about uh, the anchor tag. It's a big deal in web development, and so it's important that you know how it works because it has uh, quite a few options. Uh, you use the anchor tag to create hyperlinks within your document, and we've used hy hyperlinks all along even in this lesson where we see these are all hyperlinks. As I hover my mouse cursor over, notice that the URLs are changing uh, near the bottom left-hand corner of my web browser, all right? And you know how hyperlinks work. You've used them probably to get to this very uh, video or, or web page where you're, you're watching this video. Uh, there's a whole section of the specification that are devoted 
two defining anchors or hyperlinks in your document. And I'm going to distill it down to just the basics uh, so that we can move through this material pretty quickly. The good news is that this is a great opportunity for you to get your hands dirty in writing some code. So what you should do at this point is download the code that's associated with this video. Uh, inside of that, that zip file there will be a folder called Lesson 05 and inside of Lesson 05 there's a before, a work folder, and an after folder. What I want to do is copy everything inside of the before folder. And I'm going to paste it in the work folder. And here's where I'm going to do all my work. So I'm going to open up lesson05.html in Notepad using any technique uh, that's uh, familiar. And if I were to just open this page up in Internet Explorer by double clicking, you can see there's just a lot of thick text with some um, H1 tags defining I'm at the top or I'm sorry I'm at the bottom and then anchor tags and we're going to add our some anchor tags right here and we'll talk about this thick text a little bit later but for now let's do this I want to start with a really simple scenario and I'm going to add a link to bing.com Bing and to do that I'm going to start with just creating a paragraph and inside of that I'm going to define an anchor tag an opening and closing anchor tag and inside of that I'm going to give a href at href attribute I'm going to set it equal to the URL of www.bing.com and then between the opening and closing uh, anchor tag I will insert any text that I want the user to be able to click on in this case to Bing. And so let's save this and then open it up in Internet Explorer. And you can see I get a hyperlink that says to Bing beneath my anchor tag uh, H1 here at the very top and my thick text below it. When I click on that, it opens up Bing.com in my web browser. Awesome. All right, so what I've done here is I've defined what's called an absolute URL where I'm including the full. Uh, HTTP colon slash slash. I'm also including all the uh, the first level, second level, and third level domain name. All right. Uh, there's also the idea of a relative URL. So in this case, let's create a reference to another page. In fact, this page will be just another .html which is akin, I guess you would say, it is a sibling to the lesson05.html page inside of the same folder. And so to create this relative URL, I'm gonna start with the opening and closing anchor tag, and then href equals, and then I'm merely gonna use the name another.html. And then here inside of, or between the opening and closing anchor tag, I'll just type in another, to another HTML page, like so save this now let's uh, go back and refresh our page you can see we get this link to another HTML page when I click on that it opens up the another .html page it's in the same folder as my lesson 05 .html page and I merely added uh, before you even uh, you know before I recorded this video I created that page added the link back to this lesson 05.html page so we're able to return here using a return hyperlink great uh, there's a bit more to this story if you take a look at uh, this folder where I'm doing all my work the lesson 05.html page that I'm currently typing in we've already looked at another.html there's also a subfolder called subfolder and inside of the subfolder there's a subfolder.html page so what if I wanted to create a relative hyperlink from this page to the page that's inside of my subfolder well to do that let's go ahead and add another paragraph tag and then inside that a href equals and here I'm just gonna type in the word subfolder since that's the name of my subfolder slash then the name of the file that I want to reference subfolder dot HTML and here I'm going to type to the subfolder HTML page and let's save that 
and then let's refresh this page and then now let's click on our new hyperlink and it takes us to you'll notice lesson 05 slash work slash subfolder slash subfolder dot html awesome now what if I wanted to return back from this page to the parent directory how would I go about doing that well you can see I've already created that hyperlink and it brings us back let's take a look at the code that I wrote to make this happen let's open this with notepad and you can see that in this case I use this special notation dot dot slash which means go to the parent directory at which point you'll find a file named lesson05.html so whenever you see dot dot and slash it means go to the parent directory to find the given resource in this case the HTML page alright um, and we're gonna come back to this notion in just a little bit we'll talk about relative URLs and give a quick overview before we finish up um, but one thing I wanted to show you is that up to this point in our page every time I click on the to Bing hyperlink it opens the hyperlink in the same tab in the same uh, instance of Internet Explorer but what if I wanted to open this up either in a new tab or in a whole new window well I can accomplish that by adding an additional attribute called target and there are a number of different target values that I could put here the one I'm going to use though is blank which means open up in a blank window essentially alright so some of the other ones have things to do with frames and we're not going to talk about frames in this series of videos just just note that there are some other uh, options here besides blank notice the the underscore before the word blank okay make sure you have that that's important let me refresh my web page and then click the to Bing link and now notice that it opens up a second instance of Internet Explorer now that's just how I have my copy of Internet Explorer um, uh, configured you can configure it to open uh, new uh, URLs in new tabs in your first instance of Internet Explorer if you wish and you would just go through uh, I'm not sure exactly where to do that I think it's somewhere in Internet Options uh, you can configure that um, I guess is right here under tabs probably all right but I'm not gonna take the time to look through that all right but that's how you would open up and the benefit of that is that it keeps your user on your page while opening up your references to other web pages that you might have if that's something that you want to enable alright finally what we want to do is talk about named anchors and that's really the purpose of having all this text I needed a lot of thick text so that I can create essentially a bookmark or I can push you deeper down into the web page using a named anchor so let's go ahead and uh, create a paragraph inside the paragraph create an anchor tag and inside the anchor tag I'm going to set the href equal to and I'm going to use a pound symbol and then the word bottom which will be the name of the anchor I'm creating and I'm just going to use this text to click on to bottom now what I want to do is scroll to the very bottom of this document and where it says I'm at the bottom I'm going to put another anchor this time I'm not going to use an href attribute instead I'm going to use the name attribute and I'm going to make sure it matches what I formerly used prior to that in the href the pound bottom now I'm just going to use the word bottom with no pound symbol so name equals bottom I'm going to save this and then let's open up Internet Explorer let's refresh this page I have my two bottom link and when I click it notice it pushes me all the way deep down to the very bottom of the web page so you see a lot of times when you have a long article there might be a go to the top of the web page uh, hyperlink in the lower in the right hand corner in which case it'll take you all the way to the top you can enable that type of uh, navigation we've been using this sort of navigation all along inside of the uh, 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 the table of contents so for example here I want to get to character encodings notice the URL in the very bottom left hand corner there's an infrastructure.html pound character encodings so that when I open this in a new tab it'll bring us not only to the infrastructure.html page but then it'll push us deep down into that web page to the named anchor character encodings to this so that we can get specifically to this part of the page all right one other thing before we conclude here let me get back and open up 
our lesson05.html page that we've been working on. Notice that once you've visited a hyperlink, the default style that's applied to those hyperlinks changes the color to purple instead of blue by default. You'll have control over this in Cascading Style Sheets. However, if you want to reset this in Internet Explorer, you'd merely go to um, the Tools, Internet Options, then you would go to Browsing History and uh, click the Delete button and make sure that you are deleting the history and then click Delete and you'll get a little message Internet Explorer has finished deleting the browsing history let's go ahead and click OK and then close down the browser so that the next time I open it up you can see it's reset which links I've already clicked through and which ones I haven't again we're, we can control the colors of the different states of a hyperlink using cascading style sheets and we'll talk about that a little bit later in this series all right okay so when we refer to external resources in an anchor element or an image element we need to be aware of path syntax and we've already looked at this a little bit whenever we were looking at the subfolder a little bit ago we've already talked about the differences between absolute and relative URLs so this really is more about referencing relative URLs because absolute URLs we would just put the full domain name and all the folders until we get to the actual resource whether that's a GIF file an HTML page or whatever the case might be so if we wanted to reference something else in our href for example of our anchor tag we would use uh, and, and that resource was in the same directory as our web page we can merely reference it like so a.gif if that file was in a parent directory we could use the dot dot slash notation that we talked about just a few moments ago if uh, the given resource is in a subdirectory uh, called images then we would use uh, images slash a dot gif and we saw this whenever we were referencing the subfolder where we use subfolder slash subfolder dot html okay uh, but what if the uh, the images folder was I guess at the same level a sibling to the current folder that we're in so then first we need to travel to the parent directory then travel to its subdirectory called images to find the a.gif so that's what's represented in that dot dot slash images slash a.gif and then finally what if the images folder was deeply nested uh, and so we have to go to the parent of the parent folder uh, and then find the images subfolder uh, where our images are stored in that case we could do dot dot slash dot dot slash images slash a dot gif okay all right so admittedly this can get quite convoluted so why not just use an absolute URL reference every single time instead of a relative URL uh, and have to contend with all these uh, navigating back and forth through the directory structure like we've been doing well if the website should ever move you'd simply need to keep the relative directory structure the same at the new server or location uh, relative to the directory structure and the same references are still valid in that case uh, you might think you might never need that but if you're developing a website locally and then you move it to a server at some point you'll quickly see the value of using relative paths over fixed or absolute paths all right also when it comes to the URL itself some characters have special meaning or must be encoded in some way so that they're properly routed to the correct resource on the web server this process is called URL encoding the best and the most frequent example that you're gonna see is whenever somebody has a space in a file name used in a URL you have to convert that space character to uh, one of two things either a plus symbol or the uh, the percentage to zero uh, ASCII code the percentage is an escape sequence to indicate that it's an ASCII value and then the two digits that follow are hexadecimal values that indicate what kind of ASCII character in this case we're representing a space character with the two zero now there are dozens and dozens that you can find uh, in any reference for URL encodings but only a handful are really used frequently so what I'd encourage you to do is just search for the term URL encoding in Bing.com or check out the Wikipedia article that you see here on the screen for more information about URL encodings 
Also, you've already seen the pound symbol used in a URL to indicate an anchor, a named anchor, deep into the body of a web page. Throughout this series, I've pointed you to specific sections on various pages in the HTML specification using the pound symbol. So I might give you a URL like this, and I'm just going to paste it in to uh, the location bar in Internet Explorer. It includes not only the HTML file, but then also a pound symbol. And again, this allows me to deep link inside of uh, the web page um, to the specific uh, the specific uh, element or item that I want to call your attention to. So, um, but there's also a way to send name value pairs in the URL. Uh, and that's called a query string. You're going to learn more about query strings whenever you learn ASP.NET as a means of maintaining state or passing values between two web pages. So you're going to see this type of URL often. Take a look at the URL on screen. Uh, www.whatever.com slash default.aspx. Then there's a question mark and then a val1 equal hello world hello and then an ampersand and a val2 equals world. So let me explain what each of these things are doing. Uh, you can pretty much, for the most part, ignore everything up to the question mark with regards to query strings. It's everything after the question mark that is a query string. The question mark clues you into the fact that we're querying, and so everything after that is a query string. And so we have a set of a series of name value pairs. The name of an attribute or property is, in this case, val1, and we set it equal to some value, hello. And then to designate that we need a second set of name value pairs, we use an ampersand symbol. And then val2 is the name of the second uh, attribute that we have set a value to, and then equal sign to the value of world. All right. So why you might ever want to do that, again, once you get into uh, more programming topics where you need to pass values from one web page to another, and it might be information that would be then used to look up something in a database. You'll see the value of that. But for now, just note that everything after the question mark is considered a query string. And you'll see those URLs often whenever you're looking throughout the internet. Okay? So that's all I really have to say about URLs and hyperlinks and anchors and uh, the difference between relative and absolute URLs and so on. But this topic will come up again briefly whenever we talk about the source attribute of the image element a little bit later in this series of videos. All right, so the final element that I want to talk about is the span. So let me get back to our table of contents here. And then I'm going to hit Control F on my keyboard and type in the span element. And right click and select Open a New Tab. So it's intended to be used generically, specifying a run of text that really doesn't fit into any of the other elements that we've already mentioned. Now, the truth be told, in previous versions of HTML, you use the span element as a hook into CSS for some inline text that you wanted to format in some special way. Say, for example, you wanted some text to be red. You might wrap it with a span tag and then give it a special class or ID name uh, in order to pluck it out and identify that little chunk of text to have a red font. Uh, that's still allowed, but you're strongly encouraged to use one of the other elements first so that the document is marked up semantically, right? Uh, so again, if you just use span elements all over the place, you use the rich semantic markup of your document that was intended with HTML5. And so you can see some uh, uses of the span tag uh, throughout the this document and it uses kind of uh, a, a code example and it's identifying some items as keywords uh, for the C programming language some items as um, uh, I guess identifiers like J and identifiers like I underscore T3 and so on okay so that would be the use of the span in this case where there's no other semantic uh, markup element that would allow you to identify given elements of this code example uh, some as variables some as keywords and so on and you could mark it up and use text coloring appropriately in that case alright now using the class attribute 
like they use here in the spec uh, as they demonstrate here in the specification uh, it does provide you some level of meaning to your span tags however since you're the one making up the values in the class attribute other applications wouldn't be able to interpret the cla that class attributes value uh, the way that they would be able to interpret HTML5 markup that's that's defined in the specification uh, the class attribute is useful for cascading style sheets, but not a screen reader, for example. The screen reader doesn't know what you mean by, uh, by ident or uh, keyword and so forth. Okay, But if you see other people's code, especially code that's written to target versions prior to HTML5, you'll see this used quite a bit, uh, and as well as its sectioning equivalent, the div tag. And we'll have more to say about the div tag in the next lesson. Okay, finally, before we wrap up this lesson, I want to talk about the uh, attributes that can be added to each HTML5 element. And there are a few global attributes that apply to many elements. Here in this case, I have a span tag on screen, you can see. And there is, first of all, a class attribute equal to storyline, and then an ID equal to first story header. In this case, I have two attributes, a class attribute and an ID attribute. Um, uh, now, I've, I've used a span tag, but I could have used any element here. These are, what I'm about to show you are global attributes that can be used on any attribute defined in HTML5. Uh, I've added a class and an ID. An ID is typically used as a, a unique identifier that I can add to each element if I so desire. The ID attribute is typically used for client-side scripting, uh, for example, whenever I use JavaScript so that I can access one item programmatically. It can also be used uh, with cascading style sheets by referencing just the ID. So the ID attribute is completely optional, but if you do choose to use it, each ID must be unique on a given page. Similar to the ID is the name attribute, which is typically used on the server side to process form data. Uh, I'm going to discuss this a little bit uh, in more detail when we get to the lesson on creating forms. It's similar in purpose, but typically it's utilized by our server-side code logic to retrieve a user-submitted value. Let's just table that discussion for right now. now let's talk about global attributes, uh, and to do that, let's be in our table of contents, let's type in global attributes, because if you look at this particular web page inside the specification, it'll give you a list of global attributes that can be applied to virtually uh, any HTML element as well as others that have some specific uses uh, and intent for uh, handling events. But let's just focus on these at the very top here. Um, the class attribute as you can see, it's one of the global attributes that are available, is a classification of a given element. You can invent as many class values as you wish, and they're typically used by cascading style sheets as a hook for styling the elements on your web pages. Other software could utilize the class attribute for other purposes. Uh, but it's a good idea to keep class names semantically correct as well. So you might be tempted to create a class called red text, and then create cascading style sheet styles that set the appearance of the font to be red. However, a better idea might be to call it something like important message, then style it with a red font if you wish. Uh, we'll talk about CSS later and we'll make sure to re-emphasize this idea. And there are other attributes like style and title that are global in nature, and then there's dozens of attributes that are uh, specific to different types of HTML5 elements, and we'll cover these as needed in the rest of our lessons. Okay, so let's go ahead and wrap this up. As you probably noticed, many of the links that I used in this lesson were from this section 4.6 in our table of contents, this text level semantics. We looked at the anchor and the M and the strong and the small and the S and the site, but we didn't look at things like the Q and the DFN and the ABR and the time and the, the VAR and the SAMP and so on. All right, so there's still a lot of work for you to do on your own. Go through each one of these and make sure you understand or at least read through uh, what the semantic value is for for these so when you face a situation where you need to add some semantic markup inside of your paragraphs you can give them the rich meaning that they deserve uh, with HTML5 okay so in the next lesson we're gonna look at structural semantics it's extremely important make sure you watch the next video as well we'll see you there thank you mm -hmm.